All right, everyone. Hi. Last class. Sad, I know. Don't cry. You crying? No. Good, don't cry. You'll be better off without me. Everyone all right? Everyone's being stressed, keeping calm and keeping human? There's so many faces here I haven't seen in a while. Anyway, uh, <laughs> if you're just the last day, it won't, it won't help. Um, so, any general questions, like not related to the exam, just general stuff? Maybe we did last week or whatever. No? Okay. Uh, a bunch of you emailed me questions. I think I've emailed answers back to all of you. I might work some of the answers into the lesson today, but I think I've, I've answered you and they weren't questions that probably would be germane for everyone. Uh, okay, so let's do this. So how many of you actually read the exam question? The sample exam. Good. How many of you actually done it? Like actually took a, take an hour and did it? Okay. I'm guessing that we're reflecting the curve. Do it. Tr trust me. Um, I'm going to go over it in some detail today. Um, unfortunately, we only have one sample question. Um, that's because I'm going to be teaching for uh, one year. Next year, I'll have many more questions to work with. But this one should be pretty indicative. Uh, I haven't written your question yet, and that's intentional. Most importantly, I don't want to accidentally give you something away because I tend to do that. So I don't know what the question is. I can't give anything away. Um, also, I will probably base the question on how I perceive you understanding or not understanding stuff, which will probably be helpful. Okay? All right, so all of you at least read the question, and then a small number have taken the time to do it. Um, if you haven't, I would recommend, but I'm about to give a huge spoiler. If you don't want to have the spoiler, you can leave. Uh, or, or you can just uh, follow along. Okay? So the format again. You're going to have two questions. Each question, 500 words. No more than 500 words. Completely open book. Bring whatever you want, print it out. Um, what's that? <laughs> Completely open book, whatever you want. Print it out. Uh, I had originally wanted to allow people to bring like, iPads or stuff, or, but, but it got too complicated. So just print out your, your stuff. Niles, you remember that last semester, right? Uh, interestingly enough. So print it out. Kill trees, I'm sorry. Uh, but there's no, way, no better way of doing it. Uh, the software will have a word count feature. Ha everyone has used exam soft type exams before? You know how that works? So if they do it right, and I hope they do it right, they did it last, no, so the last semester, they had like two windows, right, for each question. How did they, they set up? Do the word count. But there was a way to do a word count for the separate questions? Right. So can you explain that? Because I don't think they might have done it. Right, for the selection, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a couple ways of doing it. The way I think would be better is there could be two question boxes. That's what I wanted, but either way it works. In any event, you can select, do a word count, not a problem. If you, is anyone choosing to handwrite? And if you are, tell me later, and I, I'll work with you at a computer. But if in the event you do choose to handwrite it, just count up the words. Um, it takes maybe a minute or two. It doesn't take as long as you think. Uh, and, and it will make my life a lot easier. OK? OK, so the instructions. These will be the instructions in the exam. They will not change a word. Just read them now. It will save you 15 seconds in the exam. So you have three hours. Time won't be a problem. I think, Niles, last year time was not really a factor. I think most people finish on time. Yeah, time, time wasn't a factor. Uh, the challenge would be getting it down concisely. That's a word. Uh, okay, and, and don't, don't cheat. Don't do anything stupid. Uh, I, I've heard stories where people like go into the bathrooms and talk to other people. It's just, just don't do it. That's the kind of stuff that if you get caught, they report to the state bar, you'll become a lawyer. Um, it's, it's just not worth it. Repeat the class, just be, you'll still become a lawyer. Um, generally speaking, it's very hard to get kicked out of the bar in the first place, but it's very hard to get in the first place. So when you apply for the bar, it's something called a character and fitness exam. We have to list all this stuff. And any kind of disciplinary action taken against you, either for college or law school, goes on there. And you will probably have to justify to the bar why you should be uh, you know, allowed to go in. If you're just starting off as a lawyer with no experience, and you say cheated two years ago, it's going to be very hard. Uh, maybe if you've been a lawyer for 20 years, you have one active indiscretion, you can say, you know, this isn't my, this isn't my normal behavior. But if you're just starting out, it's a very, it's a very uphill battle. So just, just don't do anything stupid. It, it's, it's not worth it. Take the F, take the D. Don't, don't bother cheating. Okay. So my advice is, after you get the question, the example, the instructions are here. Go down to the bottom. 
and recycle the prompt. You'll see like a dash or a line or something to separate it. This will help guide you towards the right answer. Um, don't jump right into the fact pattern. I would recommend going through line by line the prompt because this will focus in what you need to write about. Even in your notes, you can just mark down like I have to keep my upper for this name. So you see, okay, with respect to Gonzalez, okay, that's a piece of property. Uh, Austin A, Bowie B, Eustache. Is it Eustache? How do you say it in Texas? Eustish? Eustish? Eust say it again? Eustace? Like not like Eustachian tubes, but Eustace? Okay. And and have that. So just mark off the names and the dates. So this is just in your head flagging it. Because when you want to approach a fact pattern, you don't want to waste your time. You want to write about what I want you to write about. See, if I was a jerk, I would just say discuss, right? And then you'd all be all over the place. But I'm not doing that. I'm giving you very specific directives. So at these dates, with respect to these people, what are the interests? Okay? Now, it's somewhat open-ended question to describe the interest, right? That, that, that's pretty open-ended. So you have to still use some of your own knowledge to figure out what I'm talking about in this case. One thing to stress, so in this problem, I don't know what the question will be, but there will be a series of transactions. There are going to be a lot of them, one after another after another. It's possible that person like G or H, which is at the bottom of the alphabetical ladder, hasn't gotten interest yet. At the early date, you don't need to write about someone who hasn't had an interest yet. That might seem common sense, but it's a waste of time. Don't say, you know, on, uh, on January 1st, 1937, um, Tanta Anna has no interest. You don't need to write that. Right there. The person has no interest, you don't need to discuss it. Don't waste your words and don't waste your mind. Uh, because they're going to be probably... I usually go up to... I do the letters alphabetically. So I usually go up to G or H, sometimes an I, but usually six or seven letters. So there are six or seven people, that's all you have to remember. Okay? Likewise, they're two different properties. Make sure you mark which property you're talking about. It'll usually be black acre and white acre, but here I tried to do something very Texas. So um, uh, actually, I, I had uh, various battles from revolution. At least Wikipedia told me so. What? What do you think? <laughs> S was too far in the alphabet for it to work. Thank you. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> perhaps, perhaps. Yeah, I was, I was actually at the uh, the international festival this week. Did anyone go? It was oh, you're studying files. Was, the Brazilian international festival was really nice, and this one guy had a huge "come and take it" flag, and like he even know the history, so I had to explain it to him. I was like, "Yeah, it's Bell Bar Gonzalez," and he didn't even know it. So anyway, <laughs> I'm explaining Texas history. There's something wrong with that. He just liked it because it had a cannon on it. Uh, no, this was nice. This was a Brazilian. No, no, this this was actually a Brazilian festival. It was actually really nice. It was so international. No, no, I was scared of it. I, I it petrified me. It, was, it petri The second time was better, but the first time I was petrified. I went back though. I I went back. Anyway, so let's let's walk through this. We never talk trash about the rodeo. I even put a rodeo joke in the problem. You noticed that, right? Okay, so these people didn't read it. Okay, got it. So let, let's go through it. All right, so there's always going to be a prompt. So it's going to be like uh, you're always going to be either clerking for a judge or working for a law firm or you're an associate. So the setup here is 1839, a few years after independence. Uh, the Republic declares independence. You're clerking for the Chief Justice of the Texas Supreme Court. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Oh. Okay. Uh, oh, do you know Professor Paulson, by the way? He's actually an officer of the Republic of Texas. Uh, slight deviation. It's actually a really good story. So, the Texas Supreme Court met during this brief period between independence and when it became part of the United States. So it was this brief period, and the reports of this court were, were deemed lost forever. And he discovered them in the archives somewhere in Austin. So he actually wanted to publish these reports in the Texas Supreme Court as an official opinion, right? But in order to do that under Texas law, you have to be an officer of the state. The state of Texas, the Republic of Texas, no longer existed. But because Texas allows all previous laws to be carried over, the Texas Supreme Court had the authority to designate him as an officer of the Republic of Texas. So he, he's actually an, uh, uh, the only living officer of the Republic of Texas. He has a certificate in his wall. It's actually really cool. And in fact, the statute called for him to be paid in gold, but he didn't 
<laughs> gold or the Texas dollar, but he didn't enforce that one because it's anyway. So so you're a law clerk. Uh, prepare a memorandum. Okay, five hundred words. Don't go over. Just I think last year one or two students went over, and I just stopped counting. So just don't go over. Like when when it prints out the exams for all of you, it just puts the word count right at the top, so I just know exactly how many words it is. Okay. Okay. Next. I stop reading at five hundred. Yeah, I don't, I don't pick 500 of the best words. That'd be a better way of doing it, but there's no good way of I'll just ignore the wrong guess. Okay? So one thing to keep in mind, I'll probably have something like this. So a lot of these questions are open-ended. So if you did it and your friend did it and you got different answers, don't worry. You might be right, and they might be right also. I write these questions intentionally to be as open-ended as possible because I want to give you room to show me you know your stuff. I don't really care about any particular answer. I want you to show me that you've internalized everything we've done in this class. That, that's what this exam's about. But if there are multiple options and you're aware of it, tell me about it. Say, well, this can happen or this can happen. And of course, we're more likely to do this. This shows me that not only do you know the majority rule, maybe you know the minority rule. And uh, uh, you can tell me maybe which one which one's better. Okay. I'll also tell you what kind of law is applying. Uh, I don't think I'll get, in this class, much more detail than something like this. It'll probably just be either the common law rule or the modern rule. Um, you didn't really talk about much more than this, usually first restatement or third restatement. If it's first restatement or common law, it's the old stuff. If it's third restatement or modern stuff, it's all the new stuff. And you know, the general gist is the new stuff's more fair and more uh, uh, balancing tests and more touchy-feely. Okay. Okay. All right. So, all right. So, eighteen thirty-six. It was a revolution, and actually, it's Texian. I looked it up. That's a proper term for a, a Texan during the Republic of Texas, not Texan, but Texian. Uh, so Austin claimed ownership of two plots of land. Okay, Gonzales and Alamo. Um, pay very close attention to how a person acquires a piece of land. Um, invariably, uh, people will be getting land that's not supposed to be theirs, or they're going to try and give away land that they don't own, or they're going to probably try and take land that they shouldn't be taking. There are a hundred different ways I can do it, but just pay very close attention to how people acquire land at every juncture. So Austin's about to die. He's not married. Um, that's important because as far as joint tendencies go, there's no uh, spousal survivorship. Okay, so he has three kids. Uh, Bowie, Crockett, and Dusk. That, that should be Rusk, in case anyone was wondering. Thomas Jefferson, right? Wikipedia told me well. Okay, any of these several, several friends? Eustace, Fannin, and, and uh, it should be Lamar, but I didn't get to L. If you want to see funny ones, go look at my Jersey Shore fact powers like AWOW and Fuki and Cangelina. I just had to, uh, had to go for it. <laughs> Keep on. Okay, so there are two conveyances. So let's look at each conveyance at, at a time. And I'm going to walk through this one step at a time. So let's first look at uh, uh, January 1st of 37. So on January 1st of 37, there's a conveyance. It says, I convey Gonzalez. I being Austin. So Austin conveys Gonzalez to Bowie for life. Then to Eustace and his heirs, so long as a canon remains in Gonzalez. Okay? So let's try and figure out what our interests are. Okay? Uh, I don't know. Stephanie? So what interest does Austin have? Why? So, oh no, it's because he, uh, because Eustache has a fee simple determinable, so the future yeah. is a fee simple determinable. Yeah. That's right. So Eustache, that's right, has a fee simple determinable. And actually, if you want to be precise, he has a vested remainder in a fee simple determinable. Because it's not, it hasn't happened yet. Because in the middle of this, um, Candace, what interest does uh, Bowie have? Try to do this without peeking at the answers. It'll be more. It'll be more interesting. Well, yeah. Life yeah. Yeah. But always a life estate. Okay. So let's just let's just walk through these three. So Eustace has a vested remainder in a in a, in a, a fee simple. Sorry, I can't type. Fee simple determinable. Okay. Uh, Kiri, how do we know it's a fee simple determinable? What what about this grant tells us that? And 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 how is that condition phrased? Right. Be on the lookout for these kinds of words, so long as, as opposed to the but if. 
because that's the other one. We'll do that next. So there's a vest remainder and fee simple determinable. Okay. The remainder comes after the life of state of Bowie. Austin retains a possible reverter. That's one you have to memorize. You have to know that fee simple determinable links up with a possible reverter. Just you have to memorize that. And there's a chart. It's in the notes. We did it like a four or five times. You'll have it on the exam, uh, but you gotta just have it internalized. Okay. Okay. So then that that's the first conveyance. Okay. Unfortunately, in these questions, people always die. Um, lots of people die because in property law, property usage changes hands at death. So people, there's a lot of deaths and a lot of blood. And they're going to die very quickly and usually in, in various creatively grotesque ways. So, okay, so Bowie dies, okay? Okay, so then, uh, uh, Willis, tell me, what happens when Bowie dies? Uh, On oh, his Bowie knife. Well, uh... It goes uh, to Eustache and sit at that time. People, I mean, the life of states does. Right, right, but <laughs> right, but what estate does Eustache have now? Uh, I mean, how would we describe his estate? Uh, it's like contingent on. I mean, it's contingent on whether he. No, no. Let's look at it. this one's easy. So one minute ago, uh, Stephanie just said. He had a vested remainder of fee simple determinable, which follows Bowie's life estate, right? Bowie's dead. That life estate's gone. So what estate now does Eustace have? Fee simple determinable. Exactly. All that means is his remainder came into, uh, uh, came into effect. His, his remainder came in, okay? But he only has that fee simple determinable so long as what, uh, Reese? Uh, the canon. Yeah, so long as canon. Okay. Okay. Um, Heather, what what interest does Austin have now? What do you think? What? Why? Exactly. Even though the estate passes from one to the next. That doesn't eliminate the possible reverter. That's kind of lurking in the background, no matter who has the estate, right? I mean, this could be, you know, from Bowie to Usage to C to D to E to F, whatever, keep going. That possible reverter keeps going there. No one can get rid of that except for uh, Austin. He keeps that in perpetuity and his heirs will get it afterwards. Okay? Uh, 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 sorry, Sarah. With the possible reverter, would it be necessary for Austin to enter in order for him to retake the property? Why? Yeah. 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 There's, for, with a possible reverter, there's no right of entry required. Necessary. We'll do an example about a minute, which, which is the other one, which requires it. Okay? Everyone good so far with the first two dates? Okay? So let's just keep going. Go to February 1st, 37. Sorry. Uh, okay, so there's a conveyance here. It says, I, that is Austin, convey the Alamo to Crockett and Dusk jointly. But if the Alamo fort is not maintained, then to Fan and his heirs. Okay, so let's, let's do the first clause. So, Aaliyah. I convey Alamo to Crockett and Dusk jointly. What, what interest is given to Crockett and Dusk there? Um, they're joint tenants, and they have... Uh, Good. Joint tenants. I don't know, they have the... Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. the joint tenants in common, right. What interest, um, Liz, what interest does uh, Austin have at this point, after this conveyance? That's right, he has no interest. Who has a future interest? Also. Um, Good. And how would we characterize Fanning's interest? Why? Because... 
it will go to the go to Crockett and Beth get the report it didn't need. Right. Exactly. It's a shifting executory interest. So Austin has no interest. So if it goes through the third party, we have to talk about executories. Fannin's interest will divest Crockett and Dusk. So if the Alamo Ford is neglected, the interests of, of Crockett and Dusk are divested. Shifting is when the interest of the transferee is divested, right? Springing, remember, is if the interest of the transferor is divested. Remember? Okay. Everyone get with me so far? Okay. So let's keep going. Next day, things take a turn for the worse, right? Crockett locks the Alamo Ford and prevents dust from entering. Okay. So this should make you start thinking. Remember we said that uh, or actually, David, how do we characterize the interests of joint tenants in common with respect to the land? How do, how do they share the land? What's, what's that phrase we always use? I don't remember. But Describe it. They both have 50% interest in the land, but they have access to 100% of it. Yes, the complete undivided whole, right? They have a 50% interest in the land, but they each have access to 100%, exactly like you said. So, Khaled, what happens when one of the guys locks part of the property so uh, the other guy, the other joint tenant, can't can't enter? Uh, okay. What do you be more precise? What do you mean possession is severed? Good. Okay. So, the there are four unities. Remember. Time, title, instrument, possession, right? If one of the set, one of the unities is severed, possession, the uh, joint tenancy in common becomes a tenancy in common. But there's another option. What's another option? What can happen? There was one case we did, you remember, with uh, there was like some sort of warehouse, right? And uh, some guy was keeping all of his stuff in the warehouse. And he sued, saying that you severed it. And the court didn't uh, convert to a joint tenancy, what did the court do? Who remembers? Anyone? Josh? Rent, yes. Exactly. What some courts can make you do is, is you simply force um, uh, what is it? Uh, a Crockett to pay dust rent. Some courts do this. This is more of a modern trend and probably not what courts in 1837 Texas would have done, but it is an option. Just, just so you can keep that, keep that in the back of your mind. It's important to kind of separate these out because depending on the outcome, it makes a big deal. With the first one, it becomes a tenancy in common. With the second, it remains joint tenant. And this matters a lot in a minute whenever the people start dying. Right? Everyone good so far? Yes, sir. Is the, uh, is the unity of possession only broken if he demanded entry and was denied entry? Or does it break either one if he Uh, I think if he locks a part of the area, I think it, the answer is it depends. Um, the way I phrase it here is he prevents it from entering, which suggests he tried to enter and he couldn't. So I'll, I'll try to be clear in the exam that the person actually attempted to em enter. Uh, there could be cases where you have like a big lot, right, and you, you chain off a foot of it, you know, which no one's going to. That's probably not enough to sever it, but a court could find it. If the person actually tried to go into that you know, one foot lot where it's blocked, then that'd be an area for, uh, uh, for, for severance of the unities. Okay? Who blocks that possession for partial ejectment? A court could find for partial ejectment. Under the common law, I don't think that was a concept. I think it's more maybe they throw you off. Uh, but I'll, I'll I'll make clear in the exam that the person actually denied entry, and when you see something like, see something like that, you'll know that uh, uh, the severance the union is practically severed. Okay. Everyone good with that? All right, let's move on. Okay. So on Valentine's Day, um, he's hunting.
for a lovely coonskin cap. And he forgot about the Alamo. It uh, it fell into disrepair. Okay. So, uh, Vince, what happens when the Alamo is forgotten? When it when it's no longer being maintained? What what, what what's triggered? Doesn't the payments uh, anticipatory interest triggered? Exactly. So there was a, what, what we call uh, a condition subsequent, right? It's triggered. And then Fannin's, uh, as we said before, his uh, shifting executory interest uh, uh, comes into effect. Okay? But, uh, Parker, does the mere fact that his uh, shifting executory interest comes into effect, is that enough to give him possession? Just, just, just by the moment. Okay, let's go back to the let's go back to the grant, right? This is the grant. The album was forgotten. Is that mere fact enough to give it automatically to Fannin? I don't think so. Why? No. I think it's because Dusk and Crockett still have their interest in it. Is that right? Still what would what would um Fannin have to do in order to gain it gain a uh, title to the Alamo? <clears throat> okay, so so before with Sarah I asked her with this grant, right? I asked her, does Austin need to enter in order to take the property? And she told me no. And the reason why, why did you say there? Because, um, this is a part you just memorized. <laughs> this are up. This, <laughs> fee simple, determinable. Let's go back to our handy little chart here, right? I swear I'm not making this up. We did this, right? <laughs> fee simple, determinable, right? So long as? With the future interest, I swear this is right for our notes, I'm making this up. No entry required. With a fee simple determinable, so long as the future interest does not require entry. Here, we have a different grant. Uh, Corey, what this but if language, which type of estate is the but if? Associated with. Just say it. you're on the right track. What is it? You got to remember the names. Uh, is that Brittany? Do you remember the name? Whoa, whoa, you said it. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. This is a fee simple subject condition subsequent. Remember the keywords. However, if it's satisfied, if the condition is satisfied, but the future interest is called a right of entry, a right of reentry. The key for those is you need to actually enter, right? You need to enter. This I told you, you have to memorize this table. Even if you have this in front of you, it's still not going to help you. You still need to have it internalized. Uh, that's why the open book doesn't doesn't really matter. So going back to the exam, we have this grant. If the Ford is not maintained, then to Fannin is heirs. That is a fee simple, subject to condition subsequent. The Alamo is not maintained. Uh, Kirsten, does it go back to Fannin immediately? Yes, exactly. Fannin must exercise his right of reentry. Or or to say it simply, he must enter. You can say it either way. Maybe the one's fewer words. With a fee simple, subject condition subsequent, there's a requirement that you take the affirmative steps to re-enter. Miles? Louder, I can't hear. Isn't Yes. Okay, yes. And this was a part that the terminology starts breaking down. 
So it's and this is why remember that there was that table in the book I didn't like. To be precise, it's not a fee simple subject condition subsequent, but it's treated as such because the but if language still requires you to take affirmative steps. Okay. If you notice, I said the condition subsequent is triggered. I didn't say it was a fee simple subject condition subsequent. So it's a it's a it's a very subtle distinction. Okay. Uh, these things aren't easy, but they're very, very perceptive. The estate given here is, is not a fee simple subject to condition subsequent. It's a fee simple subject to an executory limitation, which what Niall said. But it's treated as if it were condition subsequent. Okay? This but if language, this should just raise a red flag saying condition subsequent. Right of reentry is required. It still requires Fannin to take affirmative steps to enter. Okay. If you look at the way I phrased it in the, uh, yeah, let me, I'll show you how I phrase a sample answer. By the way, you don't have to get things these perfect. I mean, uh, it's, these are very somewhat, the terminology is difficult. As long as you describe the right way to happen, you'll probably get almost all the credit. So what I wrote was, failing to maintain the Alamo is not enough to trigger the condition subsequent. It still belongs to Dusk and Crockett, either as joint tenants in common or as tenants in common. Fana would need to enter for his interest to become possessory. That's the probably the most precise way of saying it. Fannin has to take steps to get in. Whereas Austin's possibly reverter in the question before happens automatically, it triggers right away, Fannin needs to take these steps. Okay. So thank you for the question. Anything else on this one? Sit in the back. Okay. Yeah, just memorize this chart. And I think I have another one, maybe in a, in a later lecture, I can't remember. But what, I did this chart a couple times. Just memorize it. Um, you'll, you'll thank yourself when you're not flipping through your notes <laughs> trying to figure out all the different nuances. Uh, it just has to be inside your head. There's no other way of doing it. Okay. Okay, so let's, let's move on. Okay, so now we're at May 1st. And, and Crockett dies. Okay? So first, let's assume that we're talking about a tendency in common. As, as in college said before. So let's assume tendency in common. Let, let's assume that the court severed it, right? Before the death uh, uh, of Thomas, how were Crockett and Dusk? What were the relationship? What, how how were they on the estate, the estate together? Uh, what do we call that? Yeah, 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 yeah. So they were joint tents in common, right? Yeah. And then we said the court severed it. Right. So after the court severed it, what did they become? Try to say number one. I already typed it. Yeah. When a joint tenancy in common sever, they're just tenants in common. A tenancy in common, same thing. Okay. When okay, so um, Erica, when one of the uh, people in a tenancy in common dies, right? So there are two of them. With a tenancy in common, one of them dies. What happened to the share of the guy who died? So so there's Crockett and Dusk. They're tenants in common. What happened to Crockett's share? Yeah, I got know. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's that'd be a good thing to know. It's a good question, though. I think so. There is. What do you, do you is there survivorship for tenancy? Yes. Jen, what do you think? Yes. For tenancy in common? No. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking here about tenancy in common. There's no survivorship for tenancy in common. None. There's no survivors for tenancy in common. So, Erica, if there's no survivorship, what happens to Crockett's share? Ladder? I don't remember. Maria, do you remember? Uh, does it go to the other one? Uh, no. See, that's what happens with survivorship. Well, where, where do you think it goes? Where does stuff usually go when someone dies? Heirs, yeah. yes, heirs, exactly. 
So if it's a 10 in common, there's no survivorship rights. Uh, Crockett's sh uh, share goes to his heirs. Everyone see that? This, yes, sir. I haven't read the exam yet. I don't know. <laughs> see, and this is why I don't write the exam before the review session, so you can't ask me questions like that. I don't know. I'm a terrible liar. I would not be able to bluff. I can't. I can't lie for crap. That's why I don't bother trying. I don't know. Maybe. I, I mean, you might just give me an idea. I don't know. But I, I uh, they can beat you up later. But it, if it's in the textbook, if it's something we cover in class, it's fair game. Um, I don't go anything outside. I mean, the way I write the exam is I go through my lecture notes page by page. And if I covered in class or something mentioned in the textbook that I talked about in class, it, it's fair game. I don't look at anything outside. Yes, sir? No errors. That's right. Uh, yeah, and that, that's actually, uh, uh, this happens later in the questions. I'll get to maybe 20 minutes or so, okay? Questions? Okay. So here, it's tens in common. There's no survivorship rights. The Crockett's shares go to his heirs. So Mr. Dust gets a new roommate. Okay, but now let's assume that it's still a joint tenancy in common. That is, the court ordered a payment of rent. So, Manny, with a joint tenancy in common, are there survivorship rights? Yes. Yes, survivorship rights, yes. So, what happens to the share of Crockett? Yeah, where do Crockett's shares go? We got some. Yeah, yeah, Dusk. Yeah, yeah. So Dusk gets Crockett shares. At that point, Dusk has fee simple. Right? But it's still subject to what limitation, uh, 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 Brandon? Is it? Yes. Yes, it's fee simple subject to the executory limitation. Even though Dusk now owns the entire thing by himself, he still has to worry about Fannin coming in if the Alamo is not maintained. Right? And, and likewise here. In the first one, the Tenzin common is still subject to the, uh, to the, uh, was it the shifting uh, executory interest. Okay, you see there are different ways to phrase it. You can say executory limitation, shifting executory interest. Shifting executory interest is probably more precise. I'd be happy if you wrote that, but if you say executory limitation, that's, that's, still, that's still correct. Okay? So if you were to convert this in the exam, if you gave me both 1 and 2, the paths on 1 and 2, that shows me you really know what's going on. You can figure out both of the maps. Am I good so far? Questions? Let's, let's keep going down the uh, calendar. Okay, so we see that on May 14th, um, there's a conveyance. Okay. It says, Dusk says, Alamo to myself for my life. And then take Amar and his heirs. Okay. Just looking at this conveyance, if you notice, um, in the prompt at the bottom, I didn't ask about May 14th. So be very careful. Don't write about stuff I didn't ask for. You're going to do it. Don't do it. I'm only discussing it here because it's interesting. But I mean, it's helpful to develop. But don't write about stuff I didn't ask you about. So there's a reason why I didn't ask. OK? So let's, let's again assume. Let's, let's take the two options. Let's say that it's just a tendency in common. If this is a tendency in common, who are the two owners of the land, Sonia? Um, no, no, no. No, no. From before. Oh, dusk and, uh... Yeah, dusk in the air. Okay. So if there's a tense in common, it's 50% dusk, 50% air, right? So, Sonia, if that's the case, and thus says, Alamut's myself for life. Is that a valid conveyance? Mm -hmm. 
What do you think? If you own 50% of the land, can you convey the entire thing? Right. So the conveyance is void. He can't alienate this thing in fee simple because he only has a half interest, right? He could sell his own 50% interest. There's no problem with that. If you're a joint tenant, you can sell inter vivos your interest, but you can't sell the entire thing. Okay? So, so that interest is void. Okay? Now let's assume that it's a joint tenancy in common. And, and Michael, if it was a joint tenancy in common, what percentage of the land does Dusk own? He owns all of them. He owns 10%. Can he give himself a life estate from that? Yes. Why? Yes. I know it's weird to give yourself a life estate, but, but there's nothing wrong with it. If you own Fee Simple, you can chop off a chunk of it. In other words, you can take some of the sticks from the bundle and give it to yourself. You can give himself a life estate. <coughs> but that life estate is still subject to the executor interest of Fannin. No matter what happens on Alamo, Fannin's executor interest still hangs over it. You can't get rid of that. Okay? Okay, so then we have the next day. So at Crockett's funeral, Fannin finally figures out that the Alamo's in disrepair. And he tells Dusk, I'm coming in. Okay? What happened to Gamar? Well, Gamar, we'll get to that in a few minutes, okay? Oh, go, well, okay, good. So, what, what interest does Gamar have? I, I forgot. I'll describe it. How, what's, in the first one, the conveyance Gamar is void. But in the second one, what, what interest does Gamar have? How would you so describe you said it? The first one is void. Second one is well, well, if it's a ten in common, right? Gamar, uh, uh, Dusk can't convey the entirety, so the entire thing is void. But in the second one, he can do that. So if he says to myself for life, and then to Gamar and his heirs, what interest does Gamar have? Does he have to be simple now? Well, think about it. What happens when you have an interest that comes after a life estate? What do we call that? I don't know. Anyone? I heard it. Remainder. remainder. Yeah. And and it, it's really it's a vested remainder because it's certain to happen. Gamar has a vested remainder. Once, uh, 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 what's his face? Dusk dies, right? But even then, the vested remainder will be subject to the uh, to Fannin's interest. You can't get away from that. No matter how many times you convey it, that is still lurking in the background. Okay? Everyone good with that so far? All right, let's let's move on. Okay, so there's a funeral. Come on, Erica. With this sentence, how can you say I hate the rodeo? I, I was petrified. It scared me. I thought I was going to get killed by the, by the little sheep. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. So May sixteenth, dusk is dead. There was a. Yeah, Sonia was actually quite violent. The Silence of the Lambs. Read it. It's right there. Okay. Anyway, well, dusk is dead, right? So under the first circumstance, this conveyance is void, right? Under, so if it's a tense in common, the conveyance is void. Okay? What does Gamar take? Uh, I'm sorry, Mohammed. What, what would Gamar take uh, in, in this situation? If, the, if this is the conveyance, right, it says, Alamo to myself for my life and to Gamar and his heirs. Assume that this conveyance is void. What would Gamar take? 
Yeah, yeah, he takes nothing. Takes nada, zero. Okay? I have a question. Yes. Uh, I think I specifically ask for what, uh, well, okay, so that's a smart answer, um, but I think in this case, uh, if his name appears in the exam in a grant, that's probably my way of saying that he was given something that doesn't actually work, so I think you should mention it. But what I meant was, you don't need to consider Gamar like in, in like February of 1837, because his name hasn't appeared yet. Think about it this way. If a person's name has appeared in a question up to a certain point, try to talk about him. Does that, that make sense? Don't like don't start talking about like Gamar and Hanta Anna in the first paragraph, because we haven't mentioned they haven't come to the issue yet. Okay? Okay. And, but, and if you're not sure whether to talk about it or not, talk about it. So that'll be the tiebreaker. You, you you'll get more points that way. You might lose some words, but you'll get some points. Okay? So Gamara takes nothing. Okay. But what would happen to Dusk's share in the Alamo at this point? Uh, uh, Drew, who gets uh, uh, Dusk's share? Remember, it was a Tantine common. Who's heirs? Dusk. Yes. So Dusk's heirs take Dusk's shares. That rhymes. So now who's living there? You have the heirs of Crockett and Dusk. They're both living there in harmony. Okay? And they're still subject to the divestment. Don't forget about that little lurking thing because it, it springs up once he enters the land. Okay? Let's say it was a, a joint tenancy in common. With the joint tenancy in common, we said that the conveyance was valid. Uh, uh, Zach, after the death of Dusk, assuming that this conveyance was valid, what interest does Gamar have? Yep. Perfect. That's exactly right. Uh, by the way, actually, I wrote this question intentionally with the two paths because I want you to see how the joint tenancy can spawn off. I mean, there's only so many ways I can ask you future interest questions, so these are the various branches. Okay. Okay. So he's dead. So now, finally, on May 30th of 87, finally, Fannin enters and demands access. There's no question. He's demanding access. Okay. We learn, or actually, uh, uh, Steve, what happens the moment Fannin enters? Yes, now Fannin owns a fee, fee simple. <laughs> and what we would say is uh, his shifting executory interest divests, right? Now, does it divest Gamar? or divest the heirs of Dustin Crockett. It doesn't really matter. Whoever's living there gets kicked off. Fannin now has it in fee simple. Everyone see that? <coughs> okay. So then we learn that on uh, December 31st, uh, Austin dies with no heirs, okay? And Jameson, since your question before, if you see someone dies with no heirs, start thinking about the Eshid or Eshiat, because it's got to go somewhere. Your land can't just disappear, okay? So then, next year, we have uh, uh, January 2nd, 1938, or 1838. And... This is going to be kind of a, a more kind of stuff we did beginning of the semester. Um, don't forget all the cases we did about hunting foxes and hunting whales and uh, finding jewels in the street and all those other cases we did the first six weeks. Uh, I will find a way to test them. I'm not sure how. 
But the reason why I did the Texas question is I wanted to do the Johnson versus McIntosh issue because it was an interesting way of doing it. But don't forget all the stuff. I, I promise you'll get, you'll get stuff on it. So Hanta Anna claims that in 1824 he bought the same land from a bunch of Native Americans who were in Gonzales, you know, people who lived there before. Eustis kicks him out. Okay. Uh, Emily, who wins? Say, say for example, Hanta Anna went to the U.S. Supreme Court and he sued Eustis, saying that you know I have a claim to this land. Who would win? Why? Because <coughs> yeah, what did that case say? Um, yes, yes, that the uh, that the Native Americans uh, with a lack capacity to con convey land. And and 1824 is actually the year of Johnson versus McIntosh. If anyone realized that, points you. Uh, but if you didn't, that's okay. So yeah. Uh, not valid, so Hantana has no claim that it belongs to Eustis. Okay? Okay, so then, at the very end, on uh, February 1st, 1838, Malam Labe, right? Come and take it. He come and took it. He sees the cannon. Going way back up, uh, uh, Taylor. What happens when the cannons removed from Gonzales? What, what happens to the initial grant? Yeah. All the way, all the way up to very, very first case. It says, uh, it so long as a, a cannon is remains in Gonzales, what happens when it leaves Gonzales? Okay, ha but precisely, what estate did Eustace have at that point? Good. So Eustace had had a, a fee simple determinable, which was divested. Right? Because the cannon was removed. Now, the trickier part though, Michael, who gets it? Go back to the grant. What what was the interest of Austin, the grantor in this case? The interest of Austin. Yeah, we said it all the way up front. What interest just from this grant, what interest does Austin have? Or what what did he have, I should say? In the nose, all at the top. Uh, he had a, a possibly reverter. Good, right? So he had a possibly reverter, yeah. but he died without heirs. So where does the land go? The Shets. Yeah, the land Eshets to Texas. Okay, that's actually it. That question, so we had 25 classes, right? This question covered about 13, 14 of them, give or take. My goal is with both questions to cover every, all 25 classes. There might be some overlap, but, I, but probably not. So everything we learned this semester will be on the exam. Uh, you're not going to... You're not going to get away. I mean, the only thing I told you is fee simple uh, is Rogan's perpetuity. So I won't test on that, but none of you are here, so it doesn't really matter. Um, that, that won't be in the exam. Uh, also, the stuff we talked about, kind of, you know, the economic concepts with the Coase theorem. Go back through that in your notes. Uh, think about, you know, the various means of acquiring property with that law. Um, we talked a lot about, you know, uh, marital property. We talked about same-sex property, uh, same-sex marriage. Um, everything we did is fair game. Um, If you want to get a sense of, of more of the questions I wrote, look at the ones I wrote from last year. If you go to the uh, go to the class blog and you click on the link for um, classes, and if you look at property two from the uh, from the fall, you won't understand the facts, uh, the rules, but this might just give you a sense of how the questions are styled. Uh, I'm not going to change my style much. In six months. And click here the final exam link, Oops. and that will take you to the exam from last semester. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're all there. Okay. That's all I got for today. Questions.
Okay. If you want to email me stuff, you can do it, but just don't do it right before the exam. Give me like at least a couple days for the exam. Um, yours is actually one of the first ones up. It's on a Saturday, right? That's evil. I don't know why they did that to you. I'm sorry. Uh, all right, it's been a pleasure. Have a good summer, everyone. Oh, I emailed them back answers. They, they, they weren't. I can go over them, but I don't like to be too. Please. And that's not what to knock the question. There were various wrinkles that were not germane enough that would be more confusing otherwise. But yes, but thank you. Oh, you're, did you have your leg fixed? No, I took off the brace for a second. Okay. Sometimes